That's it. Oh my goodness. That's the old voice of journalism, just can't keep up with the modern technology. Um, my name is Mark Little, I'm the host of this panel. Um, this is a panel that I'm hoping is going to look at how an age of superhuman technology is transforming the most human of all journalism, the, the, the journalism of the spoken word. So obviously it's a technology that's changing the form of the audio storytelling beyond podcasting, but it's also, I think, changing the function of journalism in the daily lives and the routines of the people who are our communities and our audiences. But this is not just about technology. It's about, I think, also a culture of innovation being tested by a whole new set of tools and shiny things. And how do we embrace a culture of innovation fit for purpose? Um, now, behind me, you're going to see a photograph. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself in a moment and why I put that photograph. But let me just introduce you to our, our panel um, who have incredible first-hand frontline experience. Cheryl Brumley uh, has experience of, I suppose, at the most premium level of audio journalism, first working for The Economist, now the global head of audio for the Financial Times. Uh, right beside me, Lena Beata Bedesen, uh, has been doing amazing work at Norway's biggest circulation daily newspaper, Aften Post, and also coordinating across the Shipstead Group uh, when it comes to narrated journalism, audio journalism. Ezra Eamon will need no introduction to anyone who's been coming to Perugia for several years. Ezra is leading strategy innovation at the Dutch public broadcaster, NPO, also someone who has set the pace for digital transformation in organizations like the European Broadcasting Union, Media House, and also does a weekly newsletter that is a go-to for anyone interested in innovation in this field. My name is Mark Little, as I say. I was, um, for the last 15 years, a technology entrepreneur. Uh, my last company was bought by Spotify, where I'm now a strategic advisor. I come in a personal capacity, but I also come as someone who started uh, his career as the old voice of journalism. This photograph behind me, I call this up. I obviously haven't changed a day. Uh, the biggest thing you'll notice about the old voice of journalism is radio journalists wearing suit and ties. Who'd have thunk it? Um, you can see behind me in these photographs, take my first day on the job in 1990, these, like, these are magnetic tapes behind me that we used to cut up with razor blades and then join back together again with sticky tape, and they were radio programs. You'll see behind me a telephone, how quaint, rotary dialing connected by a wire. You'll see a terminal that had no internet. Uh, this was essentially kind of to the staging post for our stories. That was the old voice of journalism. What I'd like to do now is introduce our panel to talk through a few slides to talk about what we mean when we say the new voice. And I'm going to start with Lena because, Lena, you inspired me as someone watching from inside Spotify who was at the cutting edge. And Afton Poston's experiments as a newspaper group coming to the spoken word uh, using artificial intelligence, I just thought it was an amazing story. So I'm going to help you sort of go through your slides here. Let's begin with this. Why did you pick this particular image? Thank you. Um, is this one on as well? Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, we started out, we saw that uh, our subscribers were not using our subscription, as many of us exper experienced, as much as we wanted. And we also saw that our average subscriber is around 52 years old, and uh, we were already working with audio uh, and synthetic voices for our newspaper for kids. And uh, we also knew that uh, for every year, <laughs> more and more people got um, AirPods, and this is, was a great opportunity. And uh, through a lot of in-depth interviews, we saw that there is an opportunity here, and it's a hypothesis. Listeners stay subscribed for longer if they can use their subscription in more situations in life. And uh, that was the take, and that's what we uh, aimed for with our uh, cloned voice. And we cloned one of our podcast hosts. It was very early, three years ago. And compared to English and American voices, it was not perfect, but we really saw that there was an opportunity. And the opportunity is where you can't hold your phone in your hand when you're running, when you're commuting, when you are washing your house or do anything. And that's what we see, and that's where people 
<laughs> why they love to use us is because they get more value. There is more situations in their lives. So the combination of AirPods, um, but it's not. This is subscribers 52 <laughs> or 42. They will not shift from reading to listening. It's a compliment. It's something they do next. We don't see a decrease in listening. People don't love cloned voices that much, at least not in Norwegian, but they see it's a big value when they can use the subscription in other situations. And when it comes to younger people, uh, we need to do completely other things because what these people love is going into an article and say, oh, I don't have time to read this, uh, then I can listen to it. We need to use these clone voices to make different audio products, uh, offer clone voice news in a podcast, for instance. So it depends on the target group, really, what we need to do. So that's why we have a broad var variation of experiments with clone voices. Yes, and uh, one thing that we learned the last years is that most audio uh, art, written articles is 3.5 minutes. And um, that is the same as a song on Spotify. And it's pretty annoying if you had to put your hand in the pocket and put in a new song every 3.5 minutes. And uh, that was bugging when we just launched this. We were just testing it. And that was people said for the most. And we're thinking, oh, we need to solve the continuous listening uh, problem. And that's when we made playlists. And this is what happens. From 1.5, we went to uh, from five to eight articles uh, listened in a row. Uh, so uh, now we're working on recommended playlists that is personalized, but uh, we are not sure if that is correct to do, because I think that's the next slide where I can show this, is because most people here has listened to radio, and that's what we really, really learned, is that people like to be surprised. Uh, this is a quote from one of the people we interviewed. Like, one day I listened to an article and I moved on to another about Kåre Konrade, which is a famous actor in Norway, which probably wasn't an article I'd clicked on to read, but when it started pay playing and I had it on my ear, I thought, hmm, this is actually quite interesting. And we've seen a lot of this, that people want to have an easy access to just listen and listen and listen, but they're really super afraid. We've seen that in many, many interviews. Don't put me in the echo chamber. Surprise me, give me something that is uh, something I, I didn't knew I would like. So that's something we will have in mind when we know is making the recommended playlist. Put some surprises in there because people don't want to just stay in one field. Yeah. Lena, one word or phrase that came up was code switch. So a newspaper group going from the written word to the spoken word. And that's the story you've just told. And Ezra, you're coming from a public service broadcaster's point of view where the impact of AI is no less significant. In fact, as I looked through your slides earlier on, I realized just how significant and extensive the impact of AI is in all aspects of the work you're doing. Yeah, yeah certainly, Mark, because I, I, I guess we're a bit the odd one out. We're not a publisher, we're a public service media organization. And from a historical perspective, our legacy is broadcasting. We have done radio and television for a very long time, but also means that we have an extensive kind of audio ecosystem and workflows and, and whole chains that are already put in place. So it's not so much a transition from text to audio, but much more from audio to audio or from radio to audio. And that's that means also that we'd have to do a, a quite a transition in, in the company and organization itself. Um, so maybe if you go to the next slide, if you just look at the opportunities for AI and audio, and I'm not going to go through all of them, but we consider the whole audio value chain uh, that we currently have from planning to sourcing all the way to engaging and archiving. And what you see is a bit uh, a visual representation of, of our thinking. Uh, it both has a workflow logic, but also takes into account the different capabilities of AI. And uh, not so much only generative AI, because a lot of machine learning capabilities have been around for years, and, and they're part of our current workflows, are ready to analyze 
to structure and to predict what we do. Uh, it has been part for our workflows for content recommendations, in terms of subtitling, labeling our content, and much more. However, with these new generative AI uh, opportunities, it has moved from back-end processes to tools for reporters, for journalists, for people that are actually inside the newsroom, as well as opportunities to engage with our audiences in, in different ways. And that really requires a, a mental shift and also a lot of exploration and experiment. So a lot of what we do now in new things in AI are happening under the label of innovation and experiments uh, because the relationship that we have with our audience makes that trust is kind of central and before we launch something new on the on the front end or, or in the experience of the audience we really want to make sure that it takes all the boxes that are essential for us um, if you mit maybe go through a few of them now. You can still uh, stay with the, the, the previous one. Some of the things that we currently, of course, are exploring is uh, new ways of editing uh, audio. Uh, this, this, this amazing tools that allow you to actually work in the text but manipulate the audio, which makes that audio editing becomes much more flexible, much more fluid. Uh, we're also experimenting with creating AI voice uh, clones, and I'll, I'll talk a bit about one of the examples. Converting formats and going from text to audio is, is, is an, uh, an evident one, but also from audio to video, as well as from linear audio, uh, radio uh, uh, signals to audio snippets that we can redistribute, which is something that uh, before took a lot of time, but now it's much more easy with these new tools. And also um, we're looking at translating content. Uh, currently we're only reaching a fraction of our audience because the diversity set up of the Netherlands and the population is much broader than just the Dutch language. And I think we have a, a duty to reach more people with uh, different languages as well. So there's an opportunity space. Um, and I think discoverability of our audio, um, the, me the fact that you can easily transcribe and make a transcription available in your app makes also that the discovery of audio or podcast can be uh, rather a conversation rather than a discovery through keywords or, or other ways that it's currently done. So I see a lot of opportunities, but currently we're doing a lot of these things as experiments. And maybe uh, um, to, to, to give a, a bit of a framework, because this gives you uh, an example of everything that you can do, all the opportunities. And of course, we have a limited budget, we have limited time, so we have to make some choices. And maybe the next slide can... Uh, give you an example of how we look at it from... Um, so our innovation strategy for the next two years is not centered on technologies. We're not putting AI as a focus. We're putting our mission and our kind of... The, the goals that we want to achieve with it as central. And we have identified six goals, not necessarily only for AI, but of course a big focus will be uh, working with AI. And it's about encouraging digital inclusion, empathy and accessibility adding value more effectively, and there you see it's about also producing things in a better way, uh, facilitating impactful connections, because we think AI could be an isolation technology, but we want to see how we can use it for connection, engaging and retaining new audiences, increasing trust and media literacy, and then uh, adding more experience to our offer, because we also really think there's a, a, a kind of storytelling capacity and, and, and possibility there. And if you go to the next slide, there's a few examples uh, uh, that we are already have put out there. One of them is a, a so-called vodcast. It's a video podcast, but this one specifically was made for children in the age of eight and 12 to give them a kind of um, exploration of historic events. This one was about uh, the landing on the moon and it was made, uh, it was complemented with AI generated images because we wanted to make it accessible to kids that have hearing problems and that are hearing impaired. And so they experience the story also through the visuals and can follow the narrative much better. Um, I also included um, a very successful project that we have done, which are interactive pod walks. And they're, I included them because they're not made with generative AI, but they also showcase how new innovative te technologies that are also have some underlying AI uh, can still provide a lot of value. Uh, these are uh, location-based or location-triggered podcasts. So you hear a fragment if you're in the right location and it allows you to really experience a podcast by walking part of the history or part of the narrative. Uh, uh, and, and we've done that 
to recount the history of the Netherlands and really bring you to places and, and experience uh, the audio. Uh, a second example that I brought with me uh, um, is an example where we've used and experimented with voice cloning. Um, so we're not yet doing voice cloning in our linear broadcast, but we do think there is an opportunity to explore them in podcasts. And this one was specifically around the 60th anniversary of the assassination of, of JFK. And there's a Dutch um, journalist, Willem Oltmans, who was very close to almost a missing link in, in the whole investigation. And he kept for years and years diaries, but nothing really happened with those diaries. And he actually, he uh, died in 2004. So we were not able to talk with him anymore, but we had all these diaries. And uh, Avro Tros, the, the broadcaster behind it, who did it with us, they um, kind of asked the family if they could um, recreate the voice of Willem Oltman to, in his own voice, guide you through his diaries and to the theories he had. And it made for a very, very strong storytelling opportunity. And yes, we could have done it with a journalist that reenacted the voice, but by adding that specific tone of voice that he had. He was a very known journalist that also came on television. So we had a lot of audio fragments. It made the narrative just so much more gripping and so much more uh, um, kind of engaging. Um, and maybe a final example is, is something that's more uh, on the back end of, of our processes, uh, which has to do with, again, with accessibility. With AI, you really can make audio also much more customizable in terms of the audio quality and the modulations that you can do with it. Not everybody receives audio in the same way. People that have audio uh, disabilities sometimes need high tones or low tones to be different. And, and, and this allows us to really uh, um, allow for a kind of personalized audio experience rather than one signal that has to fit for everyone. So in a nutshell, a few examples of her, how we're exploring AI. So, Ezra, Helena, that is the, the possible, the near future, and the technology. Um, Cheryl, what was striking about your work is that, you know, you're in a paper that's got such a premium brand, you can't afford to mess with that. Yeah. And as you're innovating in the area of audio journalism, um, you've picked a couple of examples of, of where you've been able to push out the envelope in a way that possibly wasn't the, you know, traditional FT voice that I might have been used to. Um, so maybe talk us uh, through these couple of examples you have. First of all, Tectonic. Yes, tectonic. Well, um, first of all, I want to say thanks for having me on this panel. I'm not going to be the person who's going to bring, like Ezra and Lena, exciting AI innovations. Um, and these are just sort of old-fashioned, human-generated innovations that I wanted to talk about. I thought maybe I might preface it with why. Um, and I think what, I really, what really resonated with what Ezra said was that you are not leaning into the tech, it's more the mission, and you don't want to lose sight of the mission. And I think similarly with us, the Financial Times and particularly with the audio team is that I, our mission really is to provide um, a resource for changing audiences. And I think it's just sort of that audience need um, that we are always sort of live to. And even though we're not sort of innovating around AI, which I can talk about further later, um, I think we are not standing still by any means and we are sort of constantly evaluating sort of audience needs and changing the changing audio market and what people how they use podcasts. And so some of these podcasts sort of reflect um, remaining live to those changes in the market. Um, firstly, Tectonic is our tech show uh, that centers around um, uh, how technology is changing the lives that we lead, which is very sort of appropriate for this panel. And in fact, our last season of Tectonic, we looked at um, artificial general intelligence. Um, but in 2016 and 2019, it was a long form interview show. Um, which garnered a pretty respectable audience, um, which sort of plateaued, though, uh, towards the end of its run. Um, I came into the FT in 2019 um, and sort of re-looked at a lot of our content, and I really liked the show, and I liked the host of that show. I just felt like it, it wasn't meeting an audience need. Um, and so we did sort of a deep analysis of the uh, existing... Um, output around tech and we saw a gap in the market that sort of for the seasonal narrative shows around technology there are plenty of chat shows out there but there weren't any that did sort of deep dives in a way that I thought our journalism would be right for um, and so we pivoted in 2020 to um, actually 2021 was our first season which came out to a seasonal deep dive narrative show and I'm very sort of proud of 
of, of the shows that we put out because I think, um, you know, part of the strategy um, that I employed was to do something that no one else was doing in this sort of audio space. And I think the FT's tech journalism was looking into things like quantum tech. It was looking into things like the US-China tech race that no one else was looking into in audio. And I think that was very exciting for me. Um, and it paid off in a big way. And we grew that audience um, uh, in, in ways that exceeded my expectations for the first few years. I think we're in a space right now where um, we have plateaued, um, and I'm a huge fan of running surveys. Um, if anyone has sort of a gap in, in knowledge about who your audience is, please do run a survey or focus groups. Um, and we did it across all our shows, and Tectonic was very interesting for us because it was a really highly engaged audience that just didn't, couldn't develop a habit around this show. Um, and I do remember one comment in particular that said, don't you stop doing podcasts for a many number of months? please don't do that anymore. <laughs> so, and there were loads of comments like that. So for me, what I could discern from that research was that we had a very engaged audience, but they weren't developing habits around our products, which was Tectonic. Um, so this year, we are pivoting once again um, to reformatting it into a shorter sort of chat show with occasional long form um, series in the feed. Um, and this is because we're learning from our other shows that that is a sort of uh, a, a need for people to develop relationships. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, a need for people to sort of develop relationships with a host, um, a regular host, and also to um, to really develop habits around how they were listening. Um, so. So we'll see how that goes. I have a hunch that it will go really well um, based on what we're learning from our other shows, which are more sort of high volume, um, high output, but still rich. Another show um, uh, that I would call innovative, um, not because it's sort of an innovative format. I mean, this is Hot Money is a narrative podcast, investigative podcast that is almost as old as podcasting itself, almost. Um, uh, what I would say was innovative about this show is that it was the first time the FT had uh, a co-production partner um, with Pushkin Industries. Um, our particular partner um, was uh, very um, uh, well known in the US, which is a kind of a general growth area for the FT, but also uh, a big focus area for um, my uh, podcast team as well for growing our podcast. So this podcast was going to help us drive deeper into the U.S. market. It's very, it's a sort of prestigious market to be in, um, and it's where you can make a real splash um, uh, when you put out something successful in this space. Now, two seasons on, I would say that we're doing very, very, very well with this show. We have a, a, an IP deal, um, a derivatives deal on the back of this show. Um, which hopefully I can announce soon. Um, but it was also a first time for the FT. It was sort of the first ever sort of co-produced piece of journalism also for the Financial Times. So um, I think of, all to say that I think of innovation um, as sort of an old world thing, because, you know, humans in this world of AI are sort of very old world now. Um, but I, I still would like to emphasize, just because we're not sort of jumping into the space of AI, that we are still innovating and remaining live to sort of audiences and how they're changing and how the market is changing. And I think that is can be very powerful as long as you understand what you're doing is something that you're working and iterating out sort of live. Um, and Cheryl, one thing struck me about your work is that you said to me uh, that, you know, it may take a couple of tries yeah. for this to lock yeah. with an audience. Yeah. Like having the ability to trial, fail, trial again. Yeah is something that I think you kind of take for granted, but that definitely wasn't the way when, my, when I was coming up in yeah. journalism. Yes, well, I mean, and that's, and that's kind of something that I took from friends who work in product as well, it's just that it's iteration, you're not gonna get it right. Now, there are some podcasts like Hot Money that you launch and you have to get it right, right? But you can kind of lean on the sort of conventions of the form. Um, but for other shows, I just think of it as just a process that you can work out live in front of people and get feedback as you do it and to always be innovating and not think that you have to get it right on the first try. And one thing that's sort of, for me, all three presentations, there's a word that keeps coming back and that's, it's engagement. 
engagement, I think, with a new audience. Um, Elena, that's why, you know, the studies that you've done, the data points, like, jump off the page. They kind of blew my mind, the extent to which these new formats you're trying are reaching some very deep need among a younger generation. Tell us some of the stats that you've seen that have come out in these success stories for you. Yeah, I, uh, a bit of background. Why did we start so early making a clone voice when the voices were so crap in Scandinavian? <laughs> it actually is because we made a new product for kids to be used in school. And when we talked to the teachers, they said, we have kids with dyslexia. We have kids with attention disorders. We have kids who came to Norway yesterday in a row. We, we, we can't just have reading. We need listening. So it was a, a really, really big need. And we looked, listened to all other voices. It was really bad. <laughs> and I said, we're going to try to make the best voice possible for this group. And we did. And uh, you can't uh, track kids under 13, so we've been in hundreds of classrooms observing them using our products. And uh, I can assure you that kids from 9 to uh, 14, more people than those with dyslexia, uh, attention disorders, or those who are bilingual use our audio product, around 25% uh, of those who uh, can choose, choose to listen. And what we need to remember in an age where kids are stopped reading is just as good to listen to text. Because the thing is to have it in a context and learn the words so you understand the society and you get the information. So that was one thing. And build on top of that, we saw that we need to offer newly arriving kids to Norway text in their own language. So we made it possible in the CMS to translate text to text into seven different languages, Russian, Polish, Ukraine, and then so now we're offering all the text in seven different languages and with text to speech. And it's not perfect, but for this group, it is an opening on what is the Norwegian society about, what is the world about. And this, you have to remember, this goes for adults too. They might not be what gives you a clickbait on an article when you have an audio file there. But I was actually crying when I get uh, an email from a woman in her 30s saying, thanking for opening news for me. I have HDHD. I try to subscribe to magazines and newspapers since I was a teenager. I don't manage to read anything no, I can listen to all your articles. I hear that it's not perfect uh, because it doesn't pronounce all words uh, correctly, but it gives me access to information. So in, in this, and we are not a um, uh, public service organization, but uh, I know Shipstead and Siv Tvetnes, she's really proud of us being able to provide this. That's more important than earning money really. So I think, um, yes, we say that on a peak, on a hype now for AI, but for some people, a small group, which is not that small, 450,000 people in Norway with 5 million have problem reading. It's quite a big group. So if you look on the business side, it's also <laughs> a business interest here, if that's the language you need to speak to do something like this. Yeah. Before I move on to the, the voice cloning, there, there's only jumped out of me just week from th uh, Threads. This is Joe yeah. Apatow, who is a comedic director, uh, casting uh, his 50-something, probably, or whatever age he is, skepticism about the quality of voice. Now, I just show this because this is kind of like a conventional wisdom. And when I talk to you about the, the insane level of detail that you've gone into to make sure Norwegian uh, <laughs> is correctly translated into the synthetic voice, I just thought this is ridiculous. So just tell me a little bit about just those little nuances that you've been watching out for as you train the synthetic voice? Yeah, if you, if you listen to American English voices, it's, you can't really tell that it's not the person. Uh, the problem is that I get emails like this every week from 50-plus uh, subscribers. The problem is that I don't understand that it's a cloned voice. They think that we have hired a person who doesn't speak properly Norwegian. And the problem with Scandinavian is that we uh, differ words with where we put the stress. 
So if you put the stress in the beginning, it means something. If you put the stress in the other side, it means something else. Like you can say that uh, that image is shirt, which is fragile. I'm wearing a skirt. This is yeah, how about shirt? Shirt, shirt. Most people who list, maybe you won't see this, but for Scandinavian people, this is the identity of the language. So people, and people get frustrated when it's not uh, correct. Uh, but this, these people, they don't have any uh, reading problems, <laughs> so they don't accept it yet. But I think we will get there. We work every day with uh, correcting words. We have a linguist working every day to correct language like Biden to Biden. We did that three and a half years ago, but there are new Bidens coming up. <laughs> and uh, and um, it's a long way to go, but suddenly we will get there, and now it's new open source models available. So when we sit here next year, I think we will have much better Scandinavian voices. Ezra, what do you think about this? Well, I just wanted to add to that. I don't think that will be the problem in, in this in a, in a year anymore. The, the evolution of these speech models is so rapidly that all these kind of things are, are being kind of ironed out. I think the, 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 the real problem that will come is how real do you want it to sound? And um, how much emotion do you add to it? Because it's being replaced by, so it, it replaces uh, uh, a witness, an eyewitness that wants to be anonymized. That witness is sl slightly sad. How much of sadness do you bring in at the eye voice? I think those are the ethical the, the, uh, kind of questions that will pop up once these uh, uh, voices are so good that you cannot distinguish them anymore from real voices. One thing that came about the work, I think it was a 240% increase in listening among the youngest age groups for the experiments you've done, is that correct? No, that's not only Norway, that's uh, um, uh, actually an American study okay. uh, that I referred to. But uh, this shows something about there's the younger audience prefer audio and we should not provide them with an audio file in an article, we should provide them with what uh, you are doing, and uh, real voices or synthetic voices, that's not really the question. The thing is finding out how do they need to be served the content that they're interested in, the niches. So I think we should not forget to experiment and be creative with how we um, uh, make audio products, because it's so easy to forget it while we're uh, experimenting with this AI voices. And I think from what you said, the big problem is that you come from an audio world. I have been in NRK, uh, working with audio for many years before I moved over to newspapers. They don't have the people there that is thinking audio first. They think, oh, we have all this written content. How can we uh, serve that in audio? So I think what you're doing and you're doing, it's a really and the most important place to be because as you say, these voices will be perfect, maybe too perfect, but then you need the right content to use it with. Yeah. Yeah. And Cheryl, one thing I think is interesting, if you designed a product for the existing dominant audience, you wouldn't really embrace any of this innovation. But if you're thinking about new audiences, and I just want to ask, how do you think about you know, new markets, yeah. new niches? You're, you're going after people that may not necessarily be natural subscribers to your existing yes. product, right? Yeah, and that's, a, that's one of the goals, really, is to bring in new audiences, and new audiences is also sometimes a shorthand for younger people. But I think, I think ultimately the way that I'm thinking about it now in this moment is that, you know, a, you're not gonna, f when we're talking about podcasts and not audio generally, is a podcast is, it's monologue, it's dialogue, people come to it to, almost form a parasocial relationship with the host um, to get information and to be entertained. And I think that's really important. So when you sort of jump on these AI opportunities, I think we just have to be aware that we might undermine that first point of this sort of parasocial forming relationships with people. And that might be one way, but it is very important driver for building habits around a particular product. And it's very important for people who listen to podcasts. And I think across generations that will persist, or at least I hope. And is that the reason you're cautious about implementing kind of forward-looking 
experiments that might put you at risk in terms of that sort of link. Yeah, of absolutely. I think I just I think we've all been around long enough to have pivoted to video and to have Clubhouse be the next cool thing, <laughs> which I looked up the other day. It is now a social media app um, or a messaging app. But um, and so and maybe there was a future at one point, a dystopian where I one where I thought I might be a content moderator of Clubhouse, that's what my job would turn into, but the pandemic ended, luckily for all of us. But yes, I do, I, I think I wanna maintain that sort of focus on, on the audience and what they're telling me that they need right now, and, and I kinda see podcasts as almost a respite from all the kind of brute force technology that's sort of happening around us, and I don't mean to sound fuddy-duddy, but I think it is kind of the one area of media that I find that where people have an increasing tolerance for longer content. I actually can't think of any others, but maybe someone can pull me up on that. But I find that really interesting. I find that people like to exist in that space. They found a way to use it on their commutes um, whilst they're eating lunch. And, and those are for very important sort of interstitial spaces in which they're kind of gaining new information or just kind of taking a break. Because so. it happens with music, I know within Spotify, like there's a huge amount of attention paid now with day listing where yeah. it's the vibe of the moment of the routine. I'm on the train, I've sat yeah. down, I'm going to see something. So routine, mobility, this new generation's habits and routines are more important, are they, than yes. kind of general taste? Yeah, and I think that they might change. And I think we always have to kind of be aware of of how people are using, and you know, every time we run a survey, we ask, how, when do you listen to this? And right now, it's always the same thing. At the gym, on my commute into work, on my commute back from work, doing the dishes, right? So that might change for another generation, and we can kind of figure out how that might then inform the content, but right now, it's pretty static. As I remember a couple of years ago, Julie Pesetti organized a conference, and it was about what, what's the problem with innovation for journalism, and she came up with the shiny, happy new thing, right? That yeah. we're all looking for the shiny new thing, getting it into production. You're around long enough to know that chasing the next shiny thing is a bad way to innovate. Is there a danger that we get the pivot to audio speakers, I think, was one of the Well, I, I, I just wanted to say, I think this is my 10th anniversary at the Perugia Festival, and 10 years ago, Alexa was launched. So that was the, the age of the voice devices, and we all needed to have a voice for Alexa or for Google Home. And uh, uh, there were a lot of voice teams that were kind of set up. Uh, um, and, and, and I think one of the, the good things is, is it unlocked the idea that audio can be something structured, that it can become kind of a fragment that you surface after a question and all of these things. The reality was, of course, that the experience was quite bad because you needed to use these specific keywords and then it wouldn't give you half of the time, it wouldn't have the answer because it needed a kind of decision tree to get there. Um, the atomic news as well, that was the idea that a linear broadcast could be somehow chopped in little pieces and then you would be able to skip an item or to rearrange the flow. In reality, it just sounded bad because it was not kind of a language, kind of a flowing uh, language thing. I think what it helped us to do it was thinking differently about audio. It didn't land in, in really experiences that worked for the audience. However, I do think that all the people that had those voice teams or the same people I meet in conferences that are now doing AI and audio and voices, and they're seeing the benefit of having been through that thought process to bring people along in their, uh, um, in their newsrooms. So I don't think it was a waste of time. It was just maybe a bit too early for the technology to really work. And there's parts of AI that are currently in the same stage, too early to really kind of uh, work. But there's parts that will change and shape the, the kind of thinking about news and audio. And, and I think that's really exciting. Right. I mean, a big lesson I'm hearing is like tech companies have discovered this to their shame over time, which is just because I can do something doesn't mean I should. I have to have part of my mission. I'm really conscious of asking uh, some questions, already some hands right up there. So if I can take actually a group of questions here. In the front row, this gentleman here uh, with the white bag. Uh, I have two questions, one for after Posten. Did you think about um, converting your articles in a more conversational style with AI? And yeah. the second question uh, to NPO, I'd be very interested in your Willem Altman story. What was the response by the public? Because I can imagine if something like this would happen in Austria, people would have huge debates about, is it an ethical thing to do? Ben, did you want to start? 
Yeah, I can start. Um, two things. We are uh, making different uh, audio first experiments now with the uh, shorter that the text is written for audio. We'll be also doing something else that will be launched uh, this spring. Uh, we're using uh, made an API so we can discard all quotes, you know, text, you have extra quotes, so then you will listen to it twice, subheaders and uh, all shortenings. Oh, in Norway, SMK is Statsministerens Kontor, Prime Minister's Office. So you, we, it, it will, if it's a short thing, it will sell, say the full name. So we're experimenting with this now, how we can automatize an audio-friendly version of the article for those who want to listen to the articles. But uh, for the most, uh, looking into how we can use these voices in more creative ways without going by the written traditional articles. And as a uh, well, well, to my surprise, there was no uproar about it. I, we, of course, we, we, we carefully considered this with the family, and um, Willem Oldman was also a very outspoken, eccentric person who was out there uh, when he was alive, and somehow they, f they felt it would be fitting uh, to kind of give him this, this new opportunity to tell his story from his from his side, or at least from, from the diary that was there. But it's a, thin, a very thin line. Um, I'm originally from Belgium, and there, there was a political party that revived a politician to campaign for the party that, that was met with a, a huge uproar of people that really said, you cannot do this, this is ethically incorrect. So it's a very thin line, and, and we wouldn't do this necessarily on a, on a big scale. This was an experiment. This is not something that we will repeat many times. Maybe I might take two questions together. There's two g people right beside each other, Rene there, just in the middle, and this there. So we take those two questions together first. Go ahead. Um, hi, my name is Leonardo. I work for a Brazilian newspaper and news. Uh, we're a news group. We have a radio station. We have podcasts there as, as well. Um, this is for, more for Ezra, but it's open for, for the panel. Um, what are the ethical guidelines that you're following when you're using AI to create this kind of content? Do you have uh, a code of conduct that, uh, and how transparent are you when you are um, publishing this kind of content? Are you telling your audience this was uh, made uh, using AI or not? In what circumstances do you think that it's mandatory to say that and when you think that's not necessary? Yeah, uh, sorry. Yeah, do you want to go ahead and <laughs> yeah. Certainly, we, we do have a, a, an AI framework. Uh, first of all, there, it's a bit complicated with the Dutch public broadcasting system because we're an umbrella organization and we have 13 broadcasters with their independent newsrooms uh, and we bring them collectively together to our channels. But we have a framework of principles that is on a basic level, it's really audience first and the trust with our audience is, is key. Uh, secondly, there's, there's things that need to be to taken into account in terms of quality and, and the assurance of, of certain journalistic standards, and the, as well as ethical guidelines. And then how that's translated in the individual newsrooms, that can differ depending if they're on, on the, the kind of daily news show versus more, and this was a kind of background historical podcast, which is a kind of different uh, beast uh, uh, altogether. However, this was clearly announced in the podcast, uh, as in, in the voiceover, like we, the process itself, how it was recreated before the voice was actually used. Uh, I do think, and, and, and it's actually a, a conversation I would like to have here, we don't have yet a clear um, common way to uh, assign audio and uh, AI with labels. So th there is, there's already some thinking around text, but how do you do it in a podcast? How do you do it in audio snippets? Do you make it part of that? Do you make it part of the environment where it's accessible? There's not yet a clear answer and the conversation is going on uh, inside uh, the, the organization. Yeah, and we just pay a lot of attention to the content and authenticity initiatives that are there. Adobe is taking a great stance there. Um, Rene, you had a question. You're in the middle there. I can't see you, but yeah, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, hi, so I'm, I'm, I work for Arte, which is a public um, broadcaster as well, but for Europe. and. Um, and we're just at the early days of innovation around audio, so don't feel bad, Cheryl. Um, the question I have is, you know, it's, it sounds very compelling and exciting, the, the ways you're experimenting with things that aren't quite perfect yet. But I'm wondering from that perspective of like this, you know, for, for, for you work for public broadcaster, there's so much great audio visual content already, especially like video and, you know, content. 
which is difficult to adapt to audio. You know, like right now, for example, Arte, which is at the early days, mm -hmm. is taking audio visual news shows and just publishing them as podcasts. That's a bad podcast. Um, are you thinking about that at all? Like how to adapt this catalog of, of stuff you have already, which I think is the case with so many publishers? So what we're not yet doing very well, but it's early days, is thinking kind of across modalities, going from video to audio or from audio to, to video and, and a little bit in these experiments. I think in, in the radio department, we're much more looking how can we unlock some of our linear broadcasting in different ways by uh, trimming them down in different formats, making audio snippets, having that more accessible in, 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 in interfaces or in our uh, dedicated listening platform. But in terms of unlocking our video content as audio content, we're already actually doing that. <laughs> but as you say, in an imperfect experience, like you listen to a, a, a talk show that's actually meant for TV, and you're kind of missing half of the things because there's not the visuals that are uh, needed to understand some of the dialogue. Um, so, not yet. Quick last question, second oh, row here. Thank you. Uh, I was just wondering if you think AI could be part of the solution of the lack of model in podcast in terms of being able to do podcasts in a sustainable way, but will it also kill it? Because podcast is about intimacy and having a direct relation with a host in a way, at least. Yeah, maybe can I put that to you, Cheryl? I mean, are you fearful that like as we face this like tidal wave of generative crap? Yes, yeah. That the fact that we're like going towards synthetic voices might lead us to be not distinguishable in our podcasting or, or the voice of the power social connection? Yeah, uh, honestly, yes, at the risk of just sounding like very contrarian about AI. I think, yes, I think there are a lot of risk when we think about how to incorporate AI and clone voices um, into what we do. But I just think, I think it can be very undermining if we're not careful about how we do it and if we're not signaling in the right ways. I mean, the JFK, um, podcast sounds fascinating, and, but, and I'm sure that you had signaled to the audience what you were sort of doing, but I just think if we're not careful, we're sort of going to erode at trust and also that sort of connection, that human connection. Can I finish just with one question to all of you, the same question, um, and, and maybe start with you, Cheryl, is there's people out here who are probably saying, I'd like to do something in this area, but what's my first step? What's the first mistake I got to watch out for? So that question perhaps be to you, and I'll ask you about the same. Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> so the first mistake to watch out for or the yeah. thing to innovate around? Well, what's the first thing I shouldn't do, let's say? Okay. I mean, I would say just, I would say jumping into the clone voice thing. If you take a host, an existing host, and jumping into that space and having them do a sort of speech, text-to-speech thing. I, I, I say this because I was asked to do this the other day. So, but I just, I got very scared by that. And Lydia, you're sought out by people who want to start yeah. this journey. What's your advice to them when you meet them? You don't do things because other people or other brands are doing it. Uh, understand why you need it and whether your audience or some of your audience could benefit from it. I get people emailing me every week who wants to start, but uh, many of them, it seems like it's, they don't know what to use it for. So wait till you know why you need it and experiment with real audio because that's, that's what you need to do and this is just a beneficial thing. Uh, well, it's how you define mistakes because I really think you have to make mistakes. Um, so go out and understand the technology by experimenting. Um, I, I'm unfortunate that I'm leading both the strategy department and in the innovation department and strategies about making choices where you want to go in the future and setting those goals. But a lot of time, it's very hard to make those choices if you don't understand everything that's happening. And innovation is very much kind of trying to understand. And it's, I see it as prototyping your strategy. And in, in, in order to do it, you also have to make mistakes. So, Thank you. We're running out of time, unfortunately. I hope you will feel, as I do, that it's a great conversation with artificial intelligence that I hope leaves you more empowered at the end. That's what I'm hoping you walk away with. And that will be thanks to our panel here, to Ezra, to Lena, to Cheryl. Thank you so much, and thank you to you. you. Bye. That went fast. I can't believe it. Some of the 50 minutes, I was thinking, oh, this is. Oh, is that what that is?
Yeah. Hey, Mario, how are you, man? Good to see you. That's my, that's my son and daughter having a cuddle. 